So I'm guessing you're all probably wondering why this took so long. And that is due to, in 2018, my channel getting copyright strikes so I paused work on it. In 2019, physical disability forcing me to stop producing videos that year. 2020, pandemic overtime. 2021, even more pandemic overtime. And in 2022, recovery from pandemic overtime. Plus with Kazuki Takahashi dying, it would have been a bad idea to do a video critical of his work in the year that happened. But consequently, I can't put this off any longer either. And here we are, after several years of delays, at the final arc of the original series. We are not doing capsule monsters because just... no. Just... no. And with that final arc... eh. I've got nothing. Look, as I said with the KC Grand Prix arc years ago, this is where I was out of the original series entirely and following GX with the American broadcast. I watched the series more for the card game aspects after it got me really into that, and wanted to play what was seen and build better decks with ideas I'd get from play. But with the Grand Prix making use of either strategies that were vastly outdated, didn't work in the real game, or just more anime-only cards that were later adopted into the card game, I bowed out there due to how pointless everything was. While the Millennium World aka Pharaoh's Memories arc brought finality to the story and mysteries of the Millennium Items, the connection to dual monsters, and reveals the intricacies of the ancient conflict Atem was part of... Sorry, the interim to get to Atem's final rust was a slog that just was not interesting, as there wasn't any rules to it. And with the faster pace to the duels and new tactics I was getting from GX and the GX sets which I was quickly becoming more invested in, I just decided to not keep on with it. I tuned back in for the series' final duel, and just skipped the final shadow game in its threat, as I knew Atem was going to win anyways by Dusex Machina ass pull, as that's all he'd won by for a significant amount of the series anyways when it mattered. And it's part of the bigger issue I have with the original series. I don't give a damn about Atem! Not like that's so unusual an opinion. The Millennium World arc is often thought of as lackluster, but at least there's a valid explanation to why that, for once in all this, doesn't involve corporate douchebaggery. At the time of its development in the manga, Kazuki Takahashi began to fall ill to the point he ended up hospitalized, and had great difficulty even getting the rest of it done once he began to recover. He seriously was in need of rest, but Shueisha deadlines, as any of their big authors could tell you, are merciless. Thus, it is unsurprising and understandable that, in the middle of the arc, he pretty much had to give up, cut it short, and wrap things up leaving several things he wanted to commit more time to expand on, left on the cunning room floor. The original Yu-Gi-Oh! storyline ending on an aborted arc, which has ended up frustratingly commonplace with this franchise. Yu-Gi-Oh! GX purportedly got cut short by two cores, and its fourth season not even dubbed in the US. Four kids cut short 5D's airing schedule so they could license Yu-Gi-Oh! Zell early, as part of a transparent, malignant legal tactic to undermine Studio Gal's lawsuit against them for refusing to pay what was due as part of 4Kids' licensing agreement. And then Arc V got cut short so Konami could push forward production of Brains, only for that to massively blow up in their face, and Brains to not be the first show with the shortened final season, limiting what the staff can do to end things on a more complete note, but outright cancelled after Brains and the entire Link format kept pissing everyone off. It's frustrating that this has happened to more than half the entire franchise in some way, shape, or form, where their endings are either rushed or missing some element of proper closure, or otherwise undermine themselves for the audience. The biggest thing that was cut for fans of the original series, which we'd wanted to see and Takashi admitted the most regret towards, was abandoning the elaboration on Seto's connection to the Blue-Eyes White Dragon, and, and how Priest Seto and Atem fell into conflict in ancient times that resulted in their rivalry that's carried on to the modern day. 
as the latter of these two plot lines is not seen in this arc at all, and the former is only the most lightly touched on. And in truth, from everything we end up seeing, it shows that there is no justification for the conflict between them. Though with such, it's understandable that 20 years later, Takahashi'd eventually return to these characters for the Dark Side of Dimensions movie, which would then undermine aspects of this arc in giving finality to the series, in an attempt to both allow him and the franchise to move on to the next thing, which did not work out how he wanted to. I have so many complaints of Dark Side of Dimensions. This arc finally returns focus to the long-missing Ryo Bakura, as he is haunted by the shadow of his dark, sinister self. Yes, despite losing the Millennium Ring, he's still haunted, and with this, shifts focus to them. Yami Bakura starting his endgame to obtain all the Millennium Items, and open the gates to the Underworld. But to do so, he needs an eighth key, which can only be found within a Tam's sealed memories. This contrasted against Tsukuroto Moto's own flashbacks to how he found the Millennium Puzzle as part of a broader gaming addiction in his... relative youth, to seek out the ultimate game. As like his grandson, games and puzzles of any sort are Tsukuroto Moto's passion and obsession. Explaining how a purported archaeologist would retire to run a game shop. <laughs> Damn, man! Damn, man! In this event, the spirit of a Tem, recognizing Sugoroku carries the soul of one of his advisors, saves him and allows him to claim the puzzle, this story all important to Yugi's next course of action. Because of the events of Doma in the anime, enough time passed that the slabs key to recovering Atem's memories have already been returned to Egypt, meaning he and the others need to travel there to close all of this. But as they set that in motion, Yuki wonders if he's the reason, once more, that's holding Atem back from his memories. Again, a sign that Yugi keeps making Atem live his life for him. It's finally a sign that he's recognizing what he's been doing using a Tem as a crutch to gaining what he actually wants. Hagen and Ryuzaki make an attempt to steal the god cards. God, I hate their devolution in this run. Only getting the Millennium Items by mistake. And Yami Bakura is not happy with them doing so. He is not wrong. Unlike the four kids version, which basically nicks this conversation, Bakura and Atem have a long conversation here over their roles and things. Bakura directly making the challenge for them to have their confrontation within the world of Atem's memories, which sets up the next parts of this arc. But before that can take place, Bakura goes and kidnaps Mokuba, so Seto will be involved in everything as well. Methinks after this, Seto would make the decision to plant GPS trackers on Mokuba, as it just keeps happening in this show. But why is Bakura doing this? <laughs> Not according to the Pyramid of Light movie. However, upon summoning his Blue-Eyes White Dragon, Seto once more begins having visions of the ancient conflict, and with Bakura handing over the Millennium Eye once he wins, the questions left unanswered encourage him to take part. The Ishtar family greets the group upon arrival, taking them all down to their tomb, and upon attempt presenting the gods to recover his memories, the soul fragment Bakura left in the puzzle starts their game, spluttering the cast into multiple locations. <laughs> With this all focused upon a copy of Atem being stuck in a recreation of his memories and amidst friends and allies, both new and old, as their modern counterparts are all implied to be reincarnations. The rest of the team, with the assistance of Shadi Spirit, who is confirmed here to have been murdered by Yami Bakura years before this and his spirit has lingered on this long, entering it themselves to uncover what Bakura actually intends to find, which is sealed amidst Atem's memories this group getting the additional assistance of Babosa, an event NPC inside the game, while the true Atam and Bakura are stuck observing everything that goes on 
as if it were just one massive, gigantic, ultimate shadow game which has the potential power to rewrite history and doom the world. And that detail is where this arc ostensibly puts its foot most wrong. What is eventually revealed is this is all nothing but a facsimile of a Thames memories, and one that can be shifted and altered. While much of the arc before this revelation can be inferred to be the truth of the past, once that revelation happens, we can't trust a single thing that's shown part of this conflict as being in any way the truth. We are essentially playing out an interactive movie or visual novel that changes the longer one takes part in it and diverges from the reality of the narrative. Thus, everything depicted in the Millennium World arc cannot be taken as gospel regarding a Thames historical past. Oh, it may be based on it so some truths can be gleaned about it, but these are not the events as they happened. It's like a Doctor Who historical. You're visiting a significant period, but the fiction of the presentation calls it all into question. Hell, as Bakura awakens within the body of his past self, the original Thief King Bakura, it can be inferred that much of his actions are not reflective of what actually occurred in the past either. And as his actions drive much of the events of the arc, much of the actual story to the fall of the Thames rule cannot be trusted as fact. Though the interim details more than can. The first thing it tends to permit to see is the execution of a criminal by having his Ka spirit being taken and sealed within the monster slabs in a way fully consistent with what's been seen of the franchise in its stealing souls and stealing them in artifacts. Said items wielded by priest Seto holding the rod, Isis, Ishizu's counterpart with the talk, Mahad, whose spirit would eventually give birth to the black magician with the Millennium Ring, Seto's father Akhnadin with the eye, Karim with the scales, and Shadi the Millennium Key. Thief Makura barges in, dragging in the body of Atem's father. Everyone pontificating about the great evil Bakura has to possess to even commit this, and for the Millennium Scales to not be able to judge his evil. But really, with what's revealed about Bakura's backstory, the Scales can't judge his evil? because it's malevolence committed in the name of justice, righteous revenge exposing the lies and sins of the past. So thus, the scales do not see it as evil. Which, as I keep saying about a Tem that is seen all throughout the franchise, is a Tem cannot see this truth because of his own self-righteous arrogance denying him understanding of anyone else's perspective but his own which keeps thematically putting him in the wrong. And like the Doma arc, this arc tries to break that down, revealing Bakura's all done this and sought revenge because his village was sacrificed in its entirety to forge the Millennium Items by Atem's father, with him the sole survivor acting as the epitaph to their existence and the king's sin, with Akhnadin having the only idea of what he's talking about. The power of the ancient dual discs, the Diodonks, are far better explained here, the monsters the seven high priests can summon all being stored in specialized shrines each of them call to, which store all of the stone slabs containing monster spirits. Dude, you already knew this. Remember the memory flashes you've had already? Hell, thanks to GX, 5Ds, and Zell, we know they even predate these events in ancient Egypt as well. And this also shows how the Millennium Items magic also played part in acting as a predecessor to later actions too. No, not fusion, you go. That would make sense to anyone who's watched the sub version of Arc V. Why must you always ruin the series running gags, 4K? But even as a ten summons Obelisk in matching these events, we can already see how time is changing. Before Bakura was supposed to be naught but a footnote in the larger conflict, but here survives as his Diabound monster, thanks to the previous duel with Seto, had absorbed the power of a blue-eyes dragon. Because every other person we see here is an NPC playing to an already established script, 
but Corkin played them all for fools until their alterations to the script forced changes to their actions. Thus, it can be seen that Priest Seto's actions after this event, to seek out commoners who possess powerful monster spirits within them to be used as weapons in defense of the people, is likely reflective of what the Priest Seto actually decided to do. It is a pragmatic but understandable course of action, and one that is only encouraged by Akhenaten. Though another contrast against the Four Kids version is Mana, the future Dark Magician girl, and the relationship between her, Atem, and Mahad, the three being friends since childhood, with Mana being a goofball, and Mahad coming across clearly as the strict older brother. Much of this being blotted out in the Four Kids version of the story, where they're just his servants. Mana, Oreno, Sono, Namai o Yeruka. It makes so much sense for them to have, for so many years, made use of that alias. And hey, this really is the merit to this arc. For too long, Atem's been living solely through taking over Yugi's life, so this is nice to see. As is Atem's attempt to literally try and cheat the game by trying to get it to say his name, which is the actual goal of all of this. But apparently, the win condition is still locked up tight. But honestly, the three's relationship is straight up adorable, and makes total sense why the pair, even as monster spirits, will be among his most faithful servants. Mahad chases after Bakura, but that only results in him losing the ring to the thief, due to his monster Diabound's power to steal the abilities of things it defeats. Which doesn't actually explain how it obtained the power of the Blue Eyes. It didn't defeat a Blue Eyes in this setting, he didn't really beat one in his duel with Seto, and any effects it would have gained from the duel with Seto would have been lost when that duel ended. Regardless, his attempts to win result in Mahad fusing the monster spirit he called upon with his own power, called a Ba, to create the Dark Magician we all know and love, sending his own slab containing it to Atam to keep him safe despite his ultimate failure to stop Bakura. Mahad's loss, however, only spurs Seto's own actions onwards raiding the settlements for escaped criminals in search of any Ka-bearers that could be used to stop Bakura, one of their prisoners giving word of a powerful dragon who's raided the land, which piques his interest, as something even this priest has seen before. This leading him to Kisara, the Maiden of Eyes of Blue, who bears the spirit of that dragon within her. So this dragon Seto's been obsessed with happens to be a woman, You'd never be able to tell otherwise, since Seto's three dragons are named Azrael, Ibli, and Gibril in some of the franchise's content. Yes, they are all named after angels and beings of death. And Seto recognizes her as well, as a woman he saved in his youth, long before he was a high priest, from being sold by slavers. But it's an act that only caused him to lose everything. His mother killed, his village razed to the ground with fire, and forced to watch all of it, only for Kisara and the dragon to be his personal savior. Just as Seto in modern times, the two are connected through fates and camaraderie, begun through an impulsive act of kindness. With Bakura, he attacks Akhenaten next, invading a shrine containing all his monster spirits to feed them all to Diabound, increasing its power immensely. Bakura's future knowledge allowing him to bend Akhenaten to his will. While the original Thief King did not know it, Atem's father was not the true creator of the items. Akhenaten actually made them in his own bid for power, after he had been passed over by his father to be crowned pharaoh. During the rule of Atem's father, whose name I cannot pronounce, a terrible war broke out, and eventually Akhenaten was given his chance to gain the authority to create the Millennium Items to save the kingdom. He forsook his family, and using a tome that was, by even ancient Egyptian standards, evil. The book's origins are never explained, but with everything else in the franchise, it wouldn't surprise me if this had originated from other researchers of the origin of these monsters and their powers, and they just happened to contract with one of the most malevolent dual spirits to permit the creation. Gotta love the Numeron Dragon and underlying cosmic energy of the universe, eh? Regardless, he sacrificed Bakura's home village of Kul Elna for their creation. Thousands quartered and their spirits all taken. Their bodies melted down to be infused into the alchemical process 
that forge the Millennium Items. Full Metal Alchemist, anyone? However, from this process was also unveiled a Dark Consciousness, which was stored primarily in the Ring, who sought the item's return to the slab to unseal its true power. This is our true series big bad, Zork Necrophades, Demon of the Underworld. While the dub tried to say it was the creator and ruler of the Shadow Realm, the god of all darkness, well, we meet the god of darkness in GX, and that ain't him. Zork is just another uber-powerful dual spirit at the end of the day, its manifestation created as an embodiment of all the rage, hate, and suffering of those sacrificed to it, a malevolence that will not rest until the debt of vengeance is paid. Also, some might be asking, if he's a dual spirit, why has he never been seen as a card? And he was. It was released in the set Dark Crisis as the card Dark Master Zork, based upon the appearance used when Bakura summoned his essence during the Dark RPG Shadow game that first introduced Bakura as an antagonist for the series. I had that card from that set for a time, though I have no idea what happened to it as it had a pretty strong effect back in the day that allowed you to destroy, at bare minimum, one card per turn via rolling a die, as long as you didn't roll a six. I'm surprised I don't see it played more, honestly, as it gels well with Demise King of Armageddon decks. Hell, even during the days of the Demise OTK deck being meta-relevant in GX, I never saw it see play as an alternative or add-in to help in blowing up the opponent's field before striking hard. But this ultimately explains why Yami Bakura, he in and of himself an amalgamation of the Thief King and Zork itself, continues to return again and again. That debt will remain unpaid as long as the Millennium Items exist, thus can re-manifest himself as his essence is fundamentally part of the magic powering them. While it's clear his first encounter with Zork made Akhenaten reconsider his plans, in the presence of the conflict inside the game, the Kura reawakens the darkness inside Akhenaten's heart that even led to the Millennium Items creation in the first place, which eventually leads him to switching sides and joining Zork. And as the rest of the priests continue to chase Bakura, they're completely oblivious to what is happening to him. That strongest example being when Akhenaten tries to kill Kisara for her spirit, which Seto has since wavered on since realizing their connection. But they can't draw that spirit out of her, as unlike the monsters of the prisoners they take them from, her Ka is not born of darkness, but the light of her soul. Thus, it is only with the wish of selfless salvation that its power can be unveiled, Akhenaten all along insisting that this is the way for them to gain a power beyond God, as it has the power to challenge the gods. Well, a Blue Eyes deck did conquer the World Championship in 2016, yes, I'm still happy about that, and been an integral part to previous championship winning decks beforehand, and even these days, with the likes of Master Duel, can hold their own decently against the strongest meta-relevant decks if played the right way, and the deck doesn't brick on you, something even the best Dark Magician decks cannot make a similar claim to. So, I'd say that's accurate. And with it, they could claim attempt, place, and roll and against the expectations of everything teased up to this point, Seto refuses. His father may be falling to the darkness of his own heart and that of the items, but Seto is still shining inside. However, the constant summoning of the gods to battle Bakura's Diabound take their toll on Atem as such drains his stamina, eventually rendering him unconscious and thought dead, in which Bakura steals the puzzle's original form of the pendant. He takes it back to the statue, using on what may be required to unleash his true power as Zork once again, only to realize the truth hidden in plain sight. The eighth key keeping Zork sealed is the mystery of Atem's true name. Until that name is revealed, then even inside this historical recreation, Zork's true power cannot be unsealed. Fortunately, despite the attempt, Atem is not dead, instead more of his memories beginning to return. Remembering back to an incident with his father, where he prayed to the gods to ask his son be free of the burden of his sin, or at least the part his family played in creating the Millennium Items. Even though I'm not certain that a legacy of past sins was a thing seen of ancient Egyptian culture, that has more been a Japanese thing. 
He awakens with a mass protector calling himself Hassan watching over him. Hassan, another player in this who didn't exist originally. Now rested, Aten tries to confront Bakura again, but without the puzzle, he doesn't have the power to summon the gods. It being Mahad as the Dark Magician, who comes to his aid. As Mahad reveals, that ceremony where Atem's father asked the gods to not pass that sin onto his son, he did this right after learning what was sacrificed to make them, and took ownership of the actions of his brother. The revelation fails to calm the spirits Bakura was manipulating, then reinforcing Bakura's Dia Bound, which has continued to evolve with all the power it's devoured. Shadi and Akhenaten, however, have found the monster slab of Dia Bound, and in this era, breaking a slab was the same as tearing a card. It prevented the monster from being summoned afterwards. But this is where Akhenaten betrays them, protecting the slab, so Bakura would kill its hem, allowing Seto to take his place as Pharaoh. It's ironic that Bakura's vengeance only facilitates the plans of the man actually responsible for the atrocities he's acting in the name of, leaving him with a seemingly invincible monster. With Yugi and Ko, they've mostly been wandering around the Ark pointlessly, encountering the NPC Bobasa as said, and frequently crossing paths with the Tem as things have gone down, the lot eventually getting the idea of Bakura's plans, and that they need to find a Tem's name before Bakura does in order to prevent him from winning. But it's only after every other resort is attempted that a Tem even tries to do what he really should have done to begin with. Ask that the anger spirits judge him to see if his father's pleas for his innocence would work, and sure enough, Dusek's father no jutsu, his father's spirit coming to pay his penance to all those wronged under his rule finally exercising all of them to their rest, and giving them all the chance to finally stop Diabound. However, with Akhenaten claiming the key from Shadi, all the items have been gathered, so even as the Thief King dies, his body abandoned by Zork, revealing even the Thief himself was nothing more than a pawn and walking corpse Zork used for itself, that everything is in place for the Great Demon's revival. Akhenaten finishing the job with a Tem and company unable to move or stop him. Why? Well, as said, because it is nothing but a giant game board, and a Tem has spent the entire game asleep at the wheel. This reveal right here I've always thought was bullshit, again for why I said earlier. It threw into question the legitimacy of everything we'd witnessed. But upon reflection of Takashi falling ill, it makes more sense why he decided to just cut things short and move into the true endgame. But it's disappointing nonetheless. But regardless of that, and in focus with the actual board game being played, Bakura reveals he has three artifacts, one of which has twice now manipulated time, that have allowed him alongside his future knowledge to manipulate everything to his advantage, and allowed him to awaken Zork far earlier than he originally was. Akhenaten completes his pact with Zork, asking he spare Seto's life to become the new king in the agreement, and thus with that pact, becomes the high priest of the Dark Master, the next antagonist they are required to beat, which in the anime nonetheless just feels like padding, with them making the revelations that Seto and Atem are cousins, he's fighting his father, Akhenaten proclaiming himself the true king and protector of these lands, and he's made all the hard decisions his brother refused to as he didn't want to pointlessly cause wars. And yet, with that gentleness and weakness, his brother was seen as a god, while the hard decisions Akhenaten made made him be shunned and yada yada yada. It's everything you'd expect to be part of this scenario, even his coveting of forbidden scriptures that, again, I really wonder where the hell that book came from. Atlantis? The Aztecs of Sea Over? Don Thousand? Where did they get that? Regardless, because it's so cliché, this is probably the lowest point of this arc because, frankly, it is so overused so as to be outright boring. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. And hell, Seto is almost hypnotized into doing it, but Seto frankly can't be a king of darkness. He will always represent Aperion, king of light. And if you get that reference, 
you win. Thus, while Seto Kaiba also ends up being dragged into the game at this point, Priest Seto rejects allying with his father to supersede his cousin, defying history in doing so. But as he can't claim the peace for the board, the courageous revives his Thaif King self as well. That's not an explanation! Though Akhnaden then steals him away to convince him, leaving him to deal with Bakura, who then locks the tablet with the Millennium Items away, permitting Bakura all the time he needs to revive Zork. With Yugi and Ko, after they feed Babosa enough, it's revealed that even putting up with him was a key to finding the resting place of Atem's name. But unfortunately, Bakura's taken over Honda as a spy in their midst to continue the facilitation of his full-on wind condition. Was Takahashi just lifting from the filler arcs at this point? This keeps happening with Honda. The traps in it, however, are identical to those in the tomb that Suguroko passed through to even reach the resting place of the Millennium Puzzle. So it's not difficult for Yugi to lead them through any of them, with them discovering a hidden room behind even that. But all of them fail to realize that they can't read hieroglyphs, except for Honda. Though none of them realize Honda should not be able to read them. Aten's allies are scattered, forcing them to let the clock run out, and facing minions of Bakura's all over the game map, during which they begin to drop one by one. He decides he needs to rescue Seto, leaving Hassan to defend the others. Though it's not exactly needed, thanks to Kaiba encountering Kisara. She is nearby to see what's going down at where Akhnaden took Priest Seto. It is very hard to keep track of the two since I refer to both of them as Seto. And thus to unleash the power of her soul in his defense. Seto, in classic Seto fashion, tearing down the bullshit in front of him with a grandiose speech. Well, that ended fast. Though with Kisara dying in Seto's arms, his resolve affirms itself. So but even that doesn't end this. The set of the Battle of Ten Ancient Times is now revealed to have been possessed by Akhnaden. Akhnaden jumping ship from his original body at the last moment, and his soul possessing his son to bring his ambition full circle. Cliché? And thus we get the scene inscribed on the tablet, and show before in vastly varying ways. The Blue Eyes vs. Dark Magician. The Eternal Struggle- Why is it, despite having more power on hand when he's normal, does Seto only seem to beat a Tem when he's possessed by someone else? However, Seto's cries from within his soul stop the Blue Eyes from killing a Tem, instead Kisara's spirit coming to him and purging Akhnaden from him, fusing what remains of herself outside the slab with his soul. Destined lovers never allowed to truly forge a connection. Seto kind of approaches after this closes out to ask a Tem, just... What the actual hell? Oh look, they are calling out within the story this contradiction that has actually led dub-only viewers to condemn this arc for the overt contradiction to what was showcased occurring before. And yeah, they agree with that and what I've said. This is all fantasy based on the original events. Nothing that actually happened matches up with how things actually played out within the series' actual history of this time, despite being based upon them. But if that is true about this, then the antagonism between Seto and Atem that keeps being emphasized by Takahashi's writing is nothing more than a lie. Something that would be emphasized even more in Dark Side of Dimensions. It's at this point Bakura reveals himself as possessing Honda, attempting to kill the others in one of the traps, leading to the pair dueling, and even that is solely to stall for time, as Zork's revival begins.
You know, I totally understand why 4Kids decided to censor that, and I don't have an issue with them doing so. It is disturbing to see, as you don't expect nor want to see a demon with a dragon-headed dick larger than an airplane just waggling all about. Garo monsters are more tasteful. This results in the next five episodes being one long block of them trying to stop the Wicked God, both inside the game and because Bakura got to attempt's name first to unlock the true power of the items, the destruction of the real world as well as the dark game beginning to truly, for the first time, affect the fate of the world. <laughs> In a way, it's ironic. This all only happened because some dumbass decided to start unsealing the Millennium Items in the modern age, only to let what happened in the ancient age repeat itself, all in defiance of Atem's dying wish to let it remain locked away. This is why I view Shadi as the true villain of the franchise. He set all of this, including Zork waking up, in motion. He set almost every single piece that has been a significant player in the Millennium Item part of the plot on the board, and has chosen to take no responsibility for it. I mean, he's here as well, he's Hassan, and sacrificed himself as a piece that allows them to eventually seal Zork away again, but none of this would have happened otherwise. His sacrifice isn't an act committed to resolve that, but the same dogged servitude that even caused this mess in the first place. You can't even claim Zork played him with everything he's done with Bakura. Outside his horror-themed torture strategies, Zork has always been outright straightforward. He doesn't manipulate others. He simply waits for opportunities to encroach like a wave of darkness. Hell, even here, he engaged a tab in the exact same way as his original self, instead of approaching from a potentially different angle to silently steal the items. He just barged right in. Zork is not a terrible villain, but he's not a chess master to put them all in the place he wants, as Shadi ultimately has, merely taking advantage of others' actions. Still, what I like about this is, for the first time all series, Yugi has no choice but to be the big damn hero of everything. It's because he faces down Bakura and his newest occult deck with his own collection of more toy and cute character cards that everything else in this conflict can close. And he does it without relying on a Tem as a crutch to hide behind, but with an unwavering certainty to do this all on his own. I really wish we'd been allowed to see more of this Yugi as the series progressed. Maybe having him take over for duels where nothing major was at stake. Maybe had him be the one actually dueling in the KC Grand Prix, because it more shows my point about him and Atem. Atem is not a good duelist, but Yugi is. As he, himself, keeps driving Bakura into corners and getting out of the straits Bakura puts him in. It reaches the point that when Bakura makes it so he no longer can be defeated by the standard loss conditions of the game, Yugi still forces him to actually lose. Why the hell was the series not actually about Yugi, is what my criticism of the original series actually breaks down to, instead of what it actually ends up doing and revolving solely around and caring about Atem as the main character. And it's not like Atem and his forces are doing that well. Zork beats Exodia, Exodia for Xanity's sake, the monster that when summoned is an automatic win condition. How do you not win even while having that? Even the gods, which usually crush the Orakalko's Leviathan god with their combined attacks, are shown to have little effect on Zork. That's how ridiculous this guy is. Hell, when Priest Seto summons Kisara to actually, for the first time, do actual damage to Zork as a being of light versus a being of darkness, Seto somehow brings out his blue eyes in anger after seeing some kids that look like him and Mokuba murdered, resulting in Seto Kaiba fusing all the dragons, and then attempt fusing with them into Dragon Master Knight, inferring that attempt's soul itself holds the power of the Chaos Soldier in doing so. And even that doesn't even do enough to actually kill Zork, it just annoys him further. And the classic, not upgraded blue eyes in this setting is said to have the power to overwhelm the God cards, which wasn't even touching the power of all its fusion upgraded forms. 
Zork's entirety in these episodes is like a bad RPG end boss. No matter how much you attack him, no matter how high your level is, he just will not die. Actually, fun fact, the last time I watched the 4Kids version of this series, that was back when I was recording the footage for the Final Fantasy XIII reviews. I think either 13.1 or 13.2. And I kid you not, the show ran through these Zork battle episodes faster than I beat whatever boss I was fighting in those awful games. Ultimately, Yugi returns with the true name, and the team, by focusing on their memory of the hieroglyphs for the name, imprinted on a necklace pendant for Atem to read. Revealing Atem's name is... Atem. Yeah, kind of a lame reveal, because I've been saying it throughout the reviews, but for the answer to this series-long question to finally be answered, that was pretty damn awesome. And with his name and all memories restored, he can restore the god cards once more, and unleash the force that truly defeated Zork before. Bye-bye, <laughs> Zork! With this, Horakati does not say that Atem's entire purpose to be in this world is over as the dub infers. Instead, it is a speech on how the bonds and support he's made have allowed him to truly conquer and defeat Zork this time, instead of just his prior sacrificial charge to seal him through his own death as happened originally. And yeah, Zork and the darkness in the Millennium Ring? Actually defeated and gone, thanks to everyone's efforts. This is then contradicted by Dark Side of Dimensions, only once more to be saved by official non-canon status. But as a last piece to close this arc in his memories, Atem does something he likely wishes he had done, or reflective of something he did do. Entrust the future of all to someone he could trust to carry on in his stead. A promise one can view, Seto Kaiba has continued to carry on all of this time. Seto, you're the with this, it's back to reality and the final five episodes that compose the last arc of the series. The final duel to allow Atem onto the afterlife. With Zork's defeat now making moot the purpose of Atem's spirit even sealing himself in the puzzle as a lock to the world's magic, so Zork could not revive, there's no real point in him remaining on as a spirit. Sure, he could take over Yugi's life like he's been doing, but that wouldn't make their relationship symbiotic, but parasitic. And parasitic possession is very, very bad to depict. And Yugi too is ready to move on and stand with his own feet to face the world. Thus, while Seto asks to be the one to do it, to settle the score between them, and, in Seto's own way, thank Atem for forcing him to grow into a better person, this is something Yugi has to do. After hearing this, Seto offers cards to them, so it will be a duel befitting one with such strength as his own tribute. But again, Yugi declines, preferring to use cards both of them have shared up until now as the best way to send him off. Which is why the majority of Yugi's cards consist of ones we have never seen and possessed before in any respect, with even a 10 playing a number of new ones as well. Regardless, this duel is another record holder for one of the best in the series, and it all has to do with the intimacy the two players have with each other. With the multiple Yugi Seto duels, even with how a Tem always pulls out of his ass the way to win, the appeal of them is how familiar we are with their cards through everything we've seen of them, and how their playstyles work. And this is ultimately mirroring that through the two that have shared everything for years now. Really, they try to repeat this with Yuma and Astral at the end of Zell, and they completely screwed it up there as they kept showing Yuma as an incompetent duelist throughout the series who only won the further the story moved on by pulling things out of his ass if Astral wasn't around to tell him what to do. Essentially, the opposite problem Yugi and Tem had, where Tem's knowledge of the card game was derived from Yugi's, and he just played less creatively than Yugi did. Thus, for someone like me who has repeatedly noted how poor a player of the card game that Atem actually is, it's completely unsurprising that he keeps summoning his ace monsters, from the fusion monsters, to the dark magicians, to even the god cards, and yet keeps blowing it against Yugi's tactics, which, for a fair chunk of the duel, end up revolving around the gadget monsters. The Gadgets, if you've been living under a rock, are one of the longest recurring archetypes from a playability perspective. 
Despite first seeing card base release in a GX era structure deck, they ended up being splashed into tournament tier decks every time a new format rolled around. First, they ended up dominating as components to Cyber Dragon decks as materials for Chimera Tech Overdragon. Then, when Synchros hit the game, they were used to easily be material for level 6 through 9 Synchro Monsters. Then were easy fodder for rank 4 Exceed Monsters, and a level 4 Pendulum Summon would allow one to easily flood the field for them to facilitate any of these other plays. The key to their longevity being that when you summon one, you search another of their number. Thus, when using them, you thin your deck and have another monster replace the one you just lost. They have seen a wide variety of support, be it from their personal trap monster that gains 3,000 attack from them all being on the field, monsters that gain special effects from having them as tributes, or ones that make their search effects even stronger. And they were first used to kick a Thames ass. But part of the problem with this duel is, suddenly cars that didn't work on things like the gods suddenly work. It's kind of a frustrating contradiction, as it robs some of the menace and power of the gods from Battle City to do that after their effects and immunities were rather consistent, even if the state they're in in this duel is how they would be shown to be utilized in their real-life counterparts once the game's power creep had advanced to the point they weren't uber-powerful. But I still feel it undermines everything about how powerful these cards were supposed to be that every major duel involving their near invulnerability and difficulty in defeating them is just rendered moot. Pyramid of Light isn't good, but it at least adhered to all of the then-present rules about the god cards. The duel with Orakalkos Obelisk was kind of contrived, but again stuck to that. This... I'm happy Yuki was able to face down the gods and win, so they could move on from that, and it serves as the one true proof that he's ready to move on and stand on his own, and in turn makes Seto acknowledge him as his true rival pushing him onwards as it should have been. But it still feels like a cop-out. Still, with the gods out of the way, much like a 10 versus Kaipin Battle City, that's when things actually get interesting, as now it's an even group of exchanges between them, both having taken their most powerful combo and fusion cards, and split them so neither can make them to the other's advantage. And I think the best example of Yugi outplaying a Tem, despite a Tem over time being able to guess and plan the cards he was going to draw, is Yugi knowing all along that a Tem was going to play Monster Reborn, and prepare his counter long before a Tem even plays it to revive Osiris. And it's perfectly representative of what's happened here. As I said in the Battle City videos, a Tem's role would have been that of Osiris, had he not been trapped with this duty. Thus, it makes the most sense possible that the deciding move would be for Yugi to seal away the power of resurrection, simply so as to stop Osiris' return from death, symbolic of them sending Atem on to his rest. And with the duel won, Atem having lost, the doors to the afterlife open to welcome him in and welcome him home. Just imagine him opening those doors and Zul being there. That will never not leave your heads now. And hey, it's a legit sad moment that this is how the journey ends, with one of them dying. But in others, it's a happy one. The seal on magic is gone, the darkness has been calmed, and the threat lost. And at last, the duties he's held for thousands of years is done, and a ten can finally rest amidst everyone he's ever cared for, that have long since turned to dust. Their wait is over. Their reunion has finally come. With that, the temple collapses, the Earth reclaiming the Millennium Items, Shadi watching over the door to the Afterlight's closure, and with everything finally over and the threats gone, everyone returns to their lives, all looking on towards the future. The credits this time closing the aftermath fully, with everyone meeting up for final cameos for everyone ever relevant to the series, good and bad alike with many still seen playing the game, fulfilling their dreams, or seeking out their next journey. This Except, you know, for a movie that ruins that sentiment by exploring another one. But still, the Millennium World arc... I'm not partial to it. It got screwed over due to Takashi's illness, but while I don't find it engaging as I don't care about its hem, it's not bad either. 
I pretty much listed why earlier. It's the material needed to explain everything and then close the series by giving the answers we wanted that sadly didn't succeed in that. That Takashi still managed to wrap everything in a not-horrible way is impressive since a lot of series that don't have that limitation screw it up hard or don't know how to properly end, which is in its favor. I liked Mana, I liked all the priests even though they began to blur together, I liked the revelations about Bakura and Zork that showed they're a good villain ultimately for the series, and how they've been there since almost day one and waited for their chance to grab everything. But like a lot of shonen series, it doesn't express everything it should, such as how it pretty much failed to show what Tamor Yugi's character growth needed to really justify the ending before this. But at least gives enough evidence of it by this arc's end to say, you might not be on the best footing for it, but at least we can see you've taken the first step to the tangible change you need to follow through. Obviously, this series got so much attention because of the card game, though, that it's since continued on its new incarnations, as well as the movie that even inspired me to start doing these thoughts reviews in the first place. But we're not getting right to that, as I still owe you all for the massive delay of the last two years towards these videos.